And I would invite you to take your Bibles and go with me to 1 John chapter 2, please. 1 John chapter 2. If you'll humor me for a moment, I would like to ask you to imagine with me that you're at a big table, maybe 20 or so friends of yours at this big table, and together you make up a chess club. Okay, just for a moment, humor me. You make up a chess club, and perhaps in this big table you have several chess boards set out, and a few games are happening. Maybe you have your coffee, some pretzels. I don't know what happens in a chess club, but let's just imagine that you're there, and that's your weekly rhythm. You do that once a week. Imagine one week uh, someone that's maybe a, a more influential member in the chess club Um, makes an announcement that he's departing this chess club and he's going to start a different club nearby. So he sets up a new uh, table and he sets out some boards on his table and it looks like pretty much the same thing is going on over there, same board, but upon closer inspection, it's not checkers actually, it's not chess actually, it's checkers over there. And uh, yeah, you don't know that. Like, you're still just at your table and you're seeking to enjoy life. You don't know that it's checkers. But, little by little, over the course of time, one by one, some of your other mates around your chess club table leave your table and join that one. Let me ask you a question. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Now, just imagine with me that the guy who kind of led the charge over there, he occasionally comes around and he will say things like, have you guys ever heard of the double jump? Or even on a special occasion, a triple jump. And you're like, no, right? And perhaps he comes around sometimes and he will say something like, you guys know what I'm talking about when I say, king me. And when you guys look at him with a puzzled look on your face, He just simply goes, hmm, and makes his way back to the table. Now, if you will humor me in that illustration for a moment, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? I mean, even though chess is the original game, and by far the superior game, you might be wondering, like, what are we missing? Right? What are we missing? What do they have over there that we don't? With that, would you look at your Bibles at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18? 1 John chapter 2, and verse 18. Children, again we note that this is a term of endearment that John uses for his people. He loves them, has a desire to see them affirmed and also protected. He says, children, it is the last hour. As I noted last week, we're kind of in the last 10, 15 minutes of God's movie, if you will. We're in the last days. John remarks that, but he has a particular reason why he says that. And as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Pause right there. John is looking ahead to say, you know that the Antichrist is coming, this the person that Paul calls the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, the sort of figurehead of deception and evil, he's going to rise at a point in time, close to the end of the age. But ahead of that, ahead of that, there will be precursors that will come. Many antichrists have come. Therefore, John says, we know that it is the last hour. So, When you see this rising tide of false teaching, rising tide of intentional deception, people leading people away from Christ, John says, you know, it's the last days. These are the last days. So the question is, as John signals a warning here for the people of God, the question is, how can we know who they are? Right? That would be a reasonable question that the people of God would ask and that you and I should ask this morning. If that's the case, if there are many deceivers out there, how can we know 
who they are. Well, John tells us, look at your text, verse 19. He starts by saying, you will know them by their departure. You will identify these deceivers by their departure. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So John says, by their departure, you can know it. Now, let me bring a point of clarity here. Um, Something that I want to say right off the bat is that what we're not suggesting is that if anyone were to leave Heritage Bible Church to go to another gospel preaching church, that they have sort of unmasked themselves as being not true followers of Jesus. That's not what we're saying this morning. What we're talking about primarily is a departure from the historic tenets of the faith, the historic tenets of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is an important distinction to make, right? They went out from us, John says, physically, but it signaled a theological departure. That's his primary concern here. It signals a theological departure. They are not with us. So John says, they went out of their own volition. These guys weren't kicked out. They went out of their own volition, but God is saying through the pen of John, look, I ordained this. I was sovereign over this to expose them, to expose the falseness of their message. As one commentator writes, their departure was their unmasking. Their unmasking. It revealed the error of their way. So, by the way, word of caution here. Word of caution is that we live in an age in which there are many, many false teachers. You can find false teaching everywhere. So it's just an encouragement for you and I to be discerning. You will hear that throughout this message, to be discerning. Not everything that comes to you with the label of Christian is Christian. You must be discerning and you need the Spirit of God and the Word of God to do so. How will we know these Deceivers, identifying them, number one, by their departure, number two, by their deception. Again, note with me your text. You will see it very clearly. But understand that this deception comes in two waves. The first thing that they will try to do is create in you a sense of lack. All right? They will create in you a sense of lack. Now, isn't this what good advertisers always do? Think about it with me for a moment before we engage the text. Isn't this what good advertisers always do? Right? Like you didn't know that Lucky Charms were magically delicious until you saw the commercial. But then suddenly you're like, I gotta have some. Or you didn't know that you were hungry until you saw that commercial. And now you're like starving. I've gotta have some food, right? That pizza looks so good. That cheese just stretched like that. It's unbelievable, right? It creates in you a sense of lack. Like, now I'm hungry. This is what false teachers will do. And usually it comes in the form of something new. Something new, right? Something you haven't heard before or seen before. They create in us a sense of lack. See in your text, verse 20. He says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Verse 21, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Now pause right there. You might be saying to yourself, Dustin, I I don't see it. Like, What do you mean by them creating a sense of lack? Well, again, note the text. Notice with me John's emphasis. He's emphasizing what they have. First of all, he's emphasizing the anointing. You have the anointing. Uh, We'll come back to this in a few moments, but uh, suffice to say that what John is referencing here is the baptism of or the initial filling of the Holy Spirit. The fact that all true believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. This is his emphasis. Moreover, he emphasizes the fact that you have knowledge, right? You know the truth. He says, I'm writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. So you have full awareness of the truth. You have full access to what can be known about God. So John is saying you have this. Therefore, by implication, what is he saying? 
you have to dig for this a little bit, by implication he's saying, this is what the false teachers are doing. They're trying to create in you a sense of lack, like you don't really have the anointing. Therefore, you don't really have the truth. You see what they're doing? Trying to create this sense of lack. Like, do you really have all of the Spirit? Have you really experienced this or that? Or have you heard of this? Something that smacks of totally new? Like, un unheard of for the last 2,000 years? John says, man, your antennas should be up. Your antenna should be up. Why? You have the Spirit. If you're in Christ by faith, you have the Spirit and you have the truth. And so they create this sense of lack. But then secondly, they are identified by those who distort the doctrines of Christ. They distort the doctrine of Christ. You can see it verses 22 and 23. Check it out with me. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Let's just pause right there for a moment. So John makes it clear that they are denying sound Christology. The question is, what, what exactly are they denying? And this is an important question because if we ask, are they outright denying Jesus Christ? We would have to say, like, it doesn't appear so because at least at one point in time they were with the family, like they were with the flock, they were with the body. So how would they have ever been with the body if they didn't have some sense of, I'm following Jesus? So what exactly are they denying? I would say that they don't deny Jesus or the concept of the Messiah. What they deny is the reality that we believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, fully man and fully God. When you take this in context with all that John has said thus far, and also especially chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, you could glance in that, at that if you'd like to. John makes it very clear, very clear, that what they are denying is the incarnation. This beautiful mystery that we understand in the gospel, theologians often will try to call the hypostatic union. It's this union of two natures, that Jesus was fully human but he was also fully divine. It's difficult for us to comprehend, but this is the truth upon which the gospel is built. And we don't have time to tease that all out this morning, but understand, if you mess with that, my friends, if you mess with that union, that Jesus Christ is fully man, but also fully God, the gospel begins to crumble. So this is crucial for us. And by the way, it's significant for us in terms of an understanding of the faith or an understanding of Christianity in our world. It's not sufficient. My friends, hear me. It's not sufficient for someone simply to say or merely to say, I believe in God. Rather, one must understand this truth that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, fully God, incarnated here, he came here, and he experienced everything that you and I experienced. He was tempted, as Hebrews says, in all points, like we are, yet he was without sin. But as a human, he was the second Adam. He was and is the representative for us. Thus, as a human, perfectly keeping the law, he could go to the cross and there fulfill the law. And there lay his life down as a sacrifice for sin. You see how all of this comes together to form the purity of the gospel. If you take one part out of it, it's no longer the gospel. Not enough for someone merely to say, I believe in God. What do they understand about the gospel? What do they understand about Jesus Christ? In fact, John doubles down on that. Look at your text. Verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. See, like, I think we're tempted sometimes to want to, and I think of a good-hearted motivation, we want to give the benefit of the doubt. But remember that there's no love really without truth. I think we're tempted sometimes to want to give the benefit of the doubt. If someone just simply says or acknowledges God, we're like, they're a Christian, right? They're good. John says, 
No, here, here. You don't have one without the other. The Father and the Son, they come together. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Whoever has the Son has the Father also. So Jesus Christ is central to the score, central to an understanding of the faith. As the 19th century theologian Herman Bovink put it, he said, Jesus Christ is Christianity itself. My friends, he is Christianity itself. He stands not outside of it, but in its center. Without his name, person, and work, there is no Christianity left. In a word, Christ, Messiah as concept, does not point out the way to salvation. He is the way itself. Okay, so you and I are saved today by grace through faith in Christ alone in his person, and in his work. But these false teachers, they've begun to mess with the doctrine of Christ, mess with Christology. And John says, this is a signal. This is a signal that they have distorted the doctrine, that they are, in fact, not true. They are deceivers. So John tells us how we can identify them, how we can know them by their departure, by their deceptions. But the question is, why does he do this? My friends, why does he do this? What is his aim here? What is his goal here? I would say to you that his goal is security. His goal is your assurance that you and I would know what it is to be assured that we are in fact good, that those who've left the table should not cause us to wonder if we're missing something. Rather, we're good. So what does John do? John pulls them close, even through the language of children. He pulls them close to provide affirmation for them. Affirmation for, for them, for their minds, and also for their hearts. Now, just this past week, Zoe came up to me, and it was clear to me that she was really intent upon talking to me. And when I uh, acknowledged her and, and brought her close, she says to me, Dad, is there something on my face? Is there something on my face? And then she went on to say, because there's these boys and they keep staring at me and I think they're laughing at me. And I'm just wondering if there's something on my face. Now, what did I do in that moment? Well, I just grabbed that little face. I first of all evaluated to see if there wasn't indeed something on her face. There was nothing on her face. But I just grabbed her little, little cheeks and I said, First of all, Zoe, there's nothing on your face. You're fine, right? Seeking to provide affirmation. And I said to her, they're probably looking at you because you're so beautiful. And then instantly in that moment, I thought, probably not what I should have said. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm starting to reach that point as a dad where I'm like, eh, I don't like that. I don't want guys looking at my little girl. So, But that's what I said. You're so beautiful. That, that's why they're looking at you. Right? There's nothing wrong with you. What is that? That's affirmation. This is what John does. That's what John does here. Again, note with me verse 20. Now look at it a little bit different way. I said we would come back to this. Hear it in terms now of affirmation. We've walked through this to, to understand their theology, what they are trying to attack the people of God with. Like they don't really have. They lack. But hear John affirm them, but you have been anointed. You have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Verse 21, I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. John says, you guys have been anointed. You have the Holy Spirit of promise. Very interesting to do a deep dive into this language of anointing. Like, what is this anointing? It always comes up, in every case, it always comes to what we would understand as the moment by which God immerses us into his family by his spirit. That Jesus Christ, as the Holy One, is the anointer, and his spirit is what he anoints us with. He immerses us, he indwells us with the person of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he promised that he would do. 
John chapter 14, see it up on the screen, verses 16 and 17. By, this is, by the way, this is one of many verses along these lines where Jesus promises this will come. I will ask the Father, in context of him leaving, he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Jesus talks, ancillary, he talks about how this helper will be of greater advantage to him. Why? Because this person of God um, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, will be with us individually. God will not be with us simply as a person in a physical body, but will be with us all, omnipresent in that sense. It's beautiful. It's phenomenal. So Jesus says, I will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him. Because, note this phrase, he abides with you. By the way, you can connect that language of abide to this, this text. He abides with you and will be in you. Jesus says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Understand, brothers and sisters, this happens once. This happens once at the point of conversion, whereby God opens our eyes to help us understand our sin and the fact that Jesus is our only hope. And when he works repentance in us, we turn from sin and turn from trusting in anything else that we think we could offer to God as reasons why he should accept us. We turn from that to trust in Christ alone. In that moment, in that moment, God redeems our soul, regenerates our soul, and fills us with his Holy Spirit. This is what John is referring to. There's no other way to understand this. John says, you have it. So those that would tempt you by saying, maybe you don't really have it, or maybe you don't have all of it. John says, no, 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 understand. You have it. You have the Holy Spirit of God within you. So don't be lured away. By the way, understand that we live in a world today where there is a lot of false teaching surrounding about the Holy Spirit. I'm just, saying, I'm just saying to you, my friends, just keep your antennas up and don't allow your heart to be moved away from the security that you have in Christ. There are people who will say, have you had this experience? Or that experience? Or maybe you're not really in. Or maybe you're not all the way in, right? No. If you're in Christ, what John wants you to understand is you have him. You have him. You have full access to God through Christ and the indwelling presence of his spirit. Moreover, you know the truth. You know the truth. Verses 20 and 21. Again, not writing because you don't know it, but because you do know it. You have the truth. And this works in tandem with the Holy Spirit. Most commentators believe that what John is referencing with regard to the heretical teaching is that it's this anointing, this extra special anointing that brings one into this new sense of knowledge or this new enlightened place with God. And when you arrive at this enlightened place with God, then you're in a new class. You're in a different category. Things are entirely changed for you. John says, that's false. That's false. By the way, please understand and please hear There's only one class of Christian. Amen? The ground is level, level at the foot of the cross. We all come to Jesus from the same place. And we all are in him together. Amen? This is huge. So John says, no, you have the spirit. Consequently, you have the word. By the way, we are so blessed, my friends, brothers and sisters, we are so blessed to be able to hold this Bible to have the preserved written word of God that we can consult in an age of a lot of confusion. We can consult the word of God and be guided by his spirit into the truth. So John says, I'm writing to you to affirm you, to bring affirmation to your soul. If you're in Christ, you have his spirit and you have his word. See it right there in the text. Moreover, he provides instruction. He provides a bit of coaching, if you will. 
right? Affirmation for our hearts and minds in the midst of a lot that is false. But then secondly, coaching. Coaching for the present, but also coaching for the future. Uh, What John tells us here is a safeguard, my friends. It's a safeguard. How do we deal with this in a world moving forward? How, How are we armored up to be secure in Christ, secure in Him, but also ready to face what potentially will be false in front of us. Check it out in your text, verses 24 and 25. John says, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Amen? Isn't that that our hope? that we can know what it is to have eternal life, be assured that we've been adopted by God into his family and that we have eternal life. What is he saying here, my friends? I think he's given us two pointers, two coaching tips, as it were. Number one, abide in the gospel. Abide in the gospel. What did, verse 24, check it out, what did they hear from the beginning? And what message is the key to fellowship with the Father and the Son? Verse 24. None other than the gospel. John is referencing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he's saying, abide in it. In fact, it's a little bit difficult to see in the English here, but the imperative in this text is the word abide. The verb or the command in this text is the word abide. He tells us, you and I need to remain here. Hang out here. You can visualize this house called gospel. Go in there. Take off your jacket and hang out for a while. You need to rehearse the gospel. Especially when we're tempted to be insecure in our faith. Or we are surrounded by a lot which pretends to be true but is false. What do we need to do? How do we fight against that, brothers and sisters? We fight against it by leaning into the gospel, by preaching the gospel to ourselves daily, by rehearsing the truths of the gospel. Amen? That's what we do. That's how we face the day. And question, what will we hear when we do that? What will we hear when we we, we rehearse the gospel truth? We will hear the voice of Christ. My friends, we will hear the voice of Christ through his spirit saying things to us like, I wanted you in my family. Is that not bolstering? Right there, beginning to bolster your heart with regard to your assurance in him. I wanted you in my family. I chose you. I came after you. A la Luke 15. I left the 99 in the fold to go after the one. You're the one. Brother, sister, you lean into the gospel. This is what you're hearing. You're the one. Jesus effectively saying, I came, I met with, encountered, confronted sin, death, hell, the grave, and I won. I won. What's that doing in your heart? In your heart, what, what, what's going on there is you are growing in assurance, in boldness, in confidence. I do know him. And the Holy Spirit of God is bearing witness with that. The Holy Spirit of God within you as you rehearse gospel truth, not the new truth, but the gospel truth, the Holy Spirit of God is saying, yes, you're mine, you're mine. This is exactly what, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we just need to go here right now if the guys can catch up in the slides. Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are, that we are children of God. Amen? Amen. This is what the Holy Spirit of God will do. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This is what John tells us to do, verse 27. Look at that last line. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, the Holy Spirit of God within you guides you into all truth and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Lean into the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. If you're in Christ, you have him. And this is phenomenal. Phenomenal. The Holy Spirit of God is within you. 
So what is the coaching? What is the teaching? The teaching is to lean into the gospel and lean into the voice of the Holy Spirit of God within. To go back. And there you have an anchor. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Wow. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. You want to talk about like higher knowledge or higher spaces? Is there anything higher than the inner place? Jesus has gone before the Holy One as the forerunner. He is now presently our high priest. There's no higher place, my friends, to go. If you're in Him, you have Him. And that's phenomenal for you. You're in Him. You know Him. You have His Spirit. You have His Word. You have everything you need. This is what John is saying. So don't listen. Don't be insecure, especially when there's so many voices running around saying, do you really? And have you experienced? And what about? John says, go back. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. That's where we go. That's where we go. So here a selection from a poem I love. Keep to the old roads. Keep to the old roads and you'll find your way. Go back to the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself. Go back, go back to the ancient paths. Latch your heart to the ancient mast and hold on, whatever you do, to the hope that's taken a hold of you and you'll find your way. Go back. My friends, go back. Abide in the gospel and abide in the Holy Spirit. Through prayer and through the reading of His Word, lean in to the Holy Spirit. Here's my heart, Lord. As the song says, speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. It will be consistent with this Word. My friends, as you live in this world where there are many messages and many access points to people that would pretend to be true, be discerning. Be discerning. How are you discerning? First of all, be sure. Be anchored. Be assured that you have what you need. You have the Spirit and you have the Word. Friends, you have the Spirit, you have the Word. So lean in. Preach the Gospel to yourself. All right, let me just pause here for a moment. Did I address verse 27 all all that much? I'm having this moment. I'm having this moment right now before I close, and I don't want to close because I already preached this once and I get confused sometimes. Did I address verse 27 or not? I don't think I did, really. So let me just say a couple words about it. So this is really connected to, and it has to be connected to Everything John is saying about going back, leaning in. You have what you need in the Spirit. You have what you need in the Word of God. What what John is saying here is not that you don't need, and I don't need, more teaching. What he's saying here, very clearly in context, is he's saying you and I don't need this new teaching and these new teachers. Why? Because you have it. That's his goal. That's his aim. So help us understand we have it. We have the Spirit of God and we have the Word of God. Lean into that. That's what he's saying. Lean into that. All right? So I wanted to make sure that question was answered. Maybe you guys have some more questions you want to throw out. (laughs) All right, but as we close, my friends, please hear me. In this age, a lot of confusion. This is... The last day, as he says, verse 18. These are the last days. How do we deal? How are we anchored? We are anchored by leaning in to the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself. Go back. Latch your heart to the ancient mast, my friends, and hold on. Okay? Hold on. 
and he'll hold you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for the clarity of your word. I pray that you would help us. Help us, God, to be amazed at what we have in you. Help us, God, to lean into what we have, to preach the gospel to ourselves, to not move away from it, to something that pretends to be new. I pray that you would help us to be men and women who rehearse and hear your voice, Holy Spirit. 